The podcast for the inquisitive diver. Hey there, dive buddies, and welcome to the show. Today we have Dr. Leonardo Guida, shark scientist and shark conservation lead at the Australian Marine Conservation Society. Welcome to the show, buddy. How you doing? Uh, thanks for having me on. It's great to, to chat with everyone and to all those listening out there. I hope I don't uh, bore you to death. <laughs> <laughs> hey, have you been? Um, I'm just going to jump straight into it here. Have you been busy yeah, with that it, um, that uh, whale that got caught up in the nets? Oh yeah, talk about timing. Mm. Um, <laughs> for a lot of reasons, I say timing because well, we're obviously having a chat, and it only happened yesterday. And mm. um, at least in the campaign space and the lobbying space and trying to enact change, whenever something like this happens, things go into full gear. But the other thing about timing is that we keep saying it every bloody year. It's like clockwork. We know when the whales are coming, the nets should not be there mm-hmm. at the very least during migration season. Yeah. Um, and it's it's quite – the difference is like night and day almost literally. You've got whales that you, you can see on um, the – I can't remember his first name, but on Instagram, Drone Shark app um, – and it's got this amazing footage of these whales going through Sydney and Bondi and up the coast, and there there are people swimming with them, you know, not knowing. And it's it's amazing stuff to see. Mm. And guess what? There are sharks around too, including <laughs> tiger sharks and whatnot. Yet you go, you literally hop the border, and those whales, as soon as they get past Tweed, bang, there's Gold Coast shark nets and drum lines. And you've got on the one hand these beautiful images streaming through daily from this bloke in his drone and then immediately next door on the next day the complete opposite and there's a mum and her bub stuck in a freaking shark net yeah and it happened last um, year as well didn't it there was a was it a car last, it- last year happened the year before happened the year before that in 2020 it was um in 2020 i remember this this is when things proper kicked off in terms of um, activism. Uh, there was in 2020 in April, mm-hmm. there were three whales caught in three days. Yeah, and the fourth within the space of four weeks, all on the Gold Coast beaches. Yeah, and when those three whales got caught in three days, um, myself, my colleague Lawrence Kleebeck at Humane Society International, um, and John McClark, who you had on before from Sea Shepherd, um, and even Andre from Envoy. And mm-hmm. this is when Envoy was. Um, currently filming or putting together their documentary on boy shark call. Yeah. And I rang the boys and I said, guys, I said, and I, I remember it as clear as day. It was a Sunday evening. And I said, guys, we've got to do something like three whales in three days. Like we, we have to capitalize on this moment and this momentum to, to really act, to, to get some change happening and get everyone, you know, on board. And that Sunday night between that Sunday, we did all the phone calls and everything like that. And mind you, coronavirus is in full swing. This is early 2020. Mm. We're heading into mid-2020. Everyone across the country is in lockdown or about to go into lockdown. And we're thinking, how on earth do we do this where it attracts media, it's visual, it's big, and we can demonstrate to the politicians in numbers that there are a lot of people in the Gold Coast community or in Queensland or Southeast Queensland, they give a shit and want to see change. In short, how do we demonstrate a public protest that's visible when we're in lockdown and yeah. you can't be within a metre and a half of anyone? And we, I had this brainwave. I took inspiration from one of our other campaigners working up on the reef and what she'd done was she'd gotten everyone to donate up near cans, to donate their fins or any dive gear, and they spelt out Save Our Reef. Mm. And I went, Andre, I go, dude, Let's get a bunch of surfboards, put the call out, and we'll spell out nets out now on the beach. And that way there, each board is clearly representative of an individual person and it's big. You can't miss it. The media is going to love it. Like, let's get on it. And so within the space, and I think Andre actually even mentioned this on, on, when he was chatting to you, in the space of like 36 hours, we'd managed to find a bloke and a few others down on the Gold Coast and he's like, yep, sweet, I can help you transport the boards. We go out there, we race out there, we tee up media, we spell out nets out now. Um, and it got the message through. And when I say got the message through, it was on all the mainstream media channels, social media, Channel 7 Evening News, Channel 9 Evening News. Um, 
We then made a few phone calls to uh, Minister Ferner's office and his advisors and tried to suss out, you know, what are you going to do about this? Um, they were very cagey, which is to be expected. Mm. And then we heard rumours. Um, so we did this protest. I can't remember the exact day. I think it was like a, might have been like a Friday morning or a Thursday morning. I think it was a Thursday morning because I made the phone call on the Sunday night and we all spoke about what we were going to do. We did the protest like a Thursday or Friday morning. And then we heard rumours um, that they were going to do something about these nets. They were going to take them out or something was going to happen. And we got a bit excited. And funnily enough, the journalist was saying, oh, so when do you expect the minister to make an announcement? And we said, make an announcement? <laughs> this is the first we've heard of it. And so long story short and down the track, what we eventually ended up um, hearing was that apparently, and I say apparently because this isn't definitive, mm. um, but apparently he was going to, or the Queensland government, I should say, was going to, in effect, remove the nets and potentially put in either lethal drum lines in their place um, or maybe drones in their place. We're not sure, but the point was apparently that weekend the nets were going to come out. Yeah. And we were waiting and waiting and waiting for this decision um, and nothing ever happened. And a few months down the track, um, rumour comes out and apparently the idea was uh, squashed at the 11th hour. Um, by who or how, we don't know. No, no um, again, Yeah, no, no. And again, I stress this is just what we heard. This isn't definitive. Okay. Um, but we went... Okay, well, the nets didn't come out, but bloody hell, we gave it a solid crack, and I think we've rattled the cage. Mm. Um, and so, again, last year, the same thing happened. Um, tragically, uh, it, it always kills me to say this, but, but tragically, there was a fatal shark bite at Green Mount Beach. Mm -hmm. And this was a beach that had drum lines and nets in the same arrangement. And so, with the utmost sensitivity, we went out in the media and on social media and everything like that. And we were like, Hey, everyone, this beach is lined with nets and rum lines. And yet someone is still unfortunately bitten and has passed away. This is, if ever you wanted evidence that these measures serve no one any good, let alone wildlife, like this is it. Mm. And then we start, and then we, um, down at Coolangatta in August, um, we managed to organise a beach protest. And again, COVID stifled just how much we could do. So we were down at Cooley. We organised the protest um, ourselves, Sea Shepherd, Envoy um, and HSI. And everyone, um, and this was just as Queensland had pretty much had in place their hard border at Coolangatta. And we had people... In Bo we had people in Byron Bay, we had people in Tweed, we had people in the northern rivers of New South Wales willing to drive two hours plus to be there and say this has to stop. Mm. And they couldn't be there because of the hard border closure. But again, given the COVID restrictions, again, given the last minute notice, we still managed to, I reckon, to get maybe 100, 200 people. You can have a look at the images on, on Envoy's Facebook page. And again, we spelt out nets out now, but this time in people. Yeah. And there were people to spare. Um, and so I reckon there would have been about maybe 200 people there. And again, you know, no matter the barrier, whether it's COVID or anything like that, people do care. They do come out and they want to see change. And these are locals. Mm. And it was a magical day. The weather was perfect. And then as if it was scripted, that Arvo, you know, the volunteers, some of the people in the protest, we all went to the Surf Life Saving Club, had a beer, had a bite to eat. We look out the window and, you know, within a stone's throw of the shoreline, there's a humpback just having a ball. Yeah. We looked out the window and some of us went out to the beach and we were just like, oh, I can't articulate it because on the one hand, you're moved by this amazing creature so close to you, yet you know that, you know, its fate is unpredictable. There are nets out there. It could hit those nets. And on the one hand, you're experiencing this emotion of humility and, Oh, oh, I don't know how to say it, but like it's like this spiritual universal experience where you're like, I as a human am this big and there's this huge ass whale out there and this is amazing, this is magical. Yet at the same time you're experiencing this emotion of dread, foreboding, anger, 
um, because there are nets out there and it could get caught in those nets and it could die. Mm. I mean, so, we've, got to, we've got to point out as well that, you know, for those people who are unaware of the nets or, uh, you know, the strength of the nets and the size of a whale, you can't just release them. If they get tangled up in no. them, there's so much power in that, um, that animal. It's extremely difficult to try and remove a net from, from a, an animal yeah, with that and, size and power. Yeah, and I should say that um, it is illegal to do so, mm. a $20,000 plus fine. Um, and this is before shark exclusion zone laws, which, which I'll touch on in a minute. Um, and whilst we get people all the time saying, oh, how come no one's out there cutting the nets? Why aren't you guys going out there cutting the nets? If I see a whale, I'm going to cut the nets. And I have to stress to anyone listening who is considering it, my strongest recommendation is don't do it. Mm. I know it's extremely difficult to hear that that's happening, let alone if you're in the water seeing it unfold. But at the end of the day, it is an extremely dangerous operation. Yeah. Um, dealing with any stressed animal, and I've dealt with stressed sharks trying to take their blood samples and everything. Dealing with any stressed animal is incredibly dangerous. And it's why the SeaWorld Rescue crew that go out there undergo extensive training. And they don't wear helmets and life jackets for no reason. Put it that way. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the slightest nick of a fin, you're talking about, a you know, an animal that weighs more than a ton or several tons, and that fin hitting you can break your ribs, rupture your organs. Mate, I, I've got a, a colleague in um, yeah. South Africa and a, just a tiny flick of a fin and he busted up two ribs straight away. Yeah. He was it, knackered. And I, I completely empathise with the sentiment about wanting to help the, the whale and the net, but I cannot stress enough, like, don't do it. it mm. It's it's not worth it. And then obviously there, there's the fine on top of that and going on uh, uh, those exclusion zones. So for those who aren't aware, in Queensland, around any shark control equipment, whether it be a drum line or, or a shark net, you're not allowed within 20 metres of it. Um, and they claimed safety and Andre articulated it perfectly when he was on your show. They claimed safety, citing a case of a young boy who was about 10 years old that got uh, tangled up in the drum line and drowned um, when he was about 10 years old. Yeah, in the 90s. Yeah. It's like, well, if you're going to claim safety, you probably should have done it then to start with. Um, but the reality was in 2019, as part of our shark conservation campaign, I say our, so Australian Marine Conservation Society International, um, we've got a, a shark conservation campaign called Shark Champions. Mm -hmm. And it's a national campaign. It's been going for about three and a half years now. And one of the elements of it is ending uh, shark culling. And so in 2019, we commissioned a photographer to go out and dive the New South Wales nets and the Queensland nets and drum lines and take photos. And people may have seen in the media those moving photos of the humpback in the net or the bull shark on the drum line with the hook through its mouth or the tiger shark on the drum line swimming around in circles. So that was Nicole McLaughlin who took these amazing photos. And she's on Instagram, um, Nicole McLaughlin photo, and you'll be able to see those images there. Um, and, yeah, the media we got from those photos alone was phenomenal. And at the same time, Queensland was undergoing fisheries reforms with their legislation and, the, and their act. And along comes this exclusion law to which we said, what? <laughs> and if you're in the know and you know how politics works, it was clearly a gag order. Yeah. It, basically, we want to stop any form of independent monitoring of this equipment so that we can control the narrative. We can control what's going on. Because we were putting out these images saying, this is what's happening. And, yeah, it was, it was, it was a gag order. Um, and it's, it's still in place. So, but despite that, I mean, you know, the proof's in the pudding. We saw what happened yesterday. Yeah. And it's, it, I mean, it's got to be said, uh, elephant in the room. Um, and I can only imagine the only reason that these things are still out there, the nets and the drum lines, whether they're smart drum lines or the uh, mm. standard baited hooks. The only reason they're there is the amount of money that's coming through the door. You know, the jobs that it's creating, um, and then it's all run by politicians who are just protecting their own ass for the next four years. Yeah, there's there's a million and one reasons. Um, I, I suppose if you start from, I suppose the most obvious, one is this reluctance to change. Mm -hmm. And yet yeah, there is that, that fear on the political side of things, and this is for consistent governments, not just the current one, that 
if they remove the equipment and someone unfortunately gets bitten or even more tragically dies, it's not so much that the public's going to blame them. It's they're going to have other politicians using that as ammunition against them, however which way. And as, as you said, you know, risks of seat, risks of re-election. Um, then you can kind of step back and look at the more sort of higher ideals and you're looking at a culture that's been ingrained since the 1960s. Yeah. And any form of culture change is inherently going to take time um, to move in a different direction, in this case, in a positive direction where we can improve beach safety. So we're under no illusions and we're not naive to think that that lethal shark control or shark culling is going to end overnight as much as we want it to. Um, it, it's going to take time to happen and that's why we've been working on it, a concerted effort on it for the past four years, a dedicated effort on it. The great thing is, is that we're seeing each year these dominoes fall where one thing happens and then we're moving towards this space of non-lethal shark control. So if we look at the history of, of when we started our, our concerted effort on shark campaigning against shark culling, we started in 2019. And that was when um, a young bloke from Melbourne, um, Daniel Christides, I think his name was, uh, tragically died in the Whit Sundays. Mm-hmm. Um was just bitten on the leg and, and tragically died in Sid Harbour. Then there was a few other bites around the same time. And what happened there was Queensland, the government actually had a roundtable meeting with the local community because tourism didn't want shark culling happening in the Great Barrier Reef or in their area because the whole point of tourism there is to come see the wildlife and the wild spaces. So they had this roundtable and the ministers at the time, you know, decided to put more money towards research. So we thought, oh, my God, this is one domino that's fallen. Like, this has set a precedent. Like, Queensland haven't done a knee-jerk reaction and gone out on a, on a shark cull. This is positive. And so we fast forward from 2018, we go to and we see this shark net incident with the whales, with four whales caught in a month. And, again, we hear rumours that the nets might be pulled out and something's going to change. Um, we go, ooh, Okay. And then at the end, and then in 2021, Queensland, for the first time in its history, trials drones at southeast Queensland beaches. Mm. And we go, boom, that's another domino that's fallen in the right direction. And so we can feel this building. We can see the change happening. It's just that it takes time and it's a marathon, not a sprint. Mm. And this year, I, I can tell you right now, just over the past couple of days, uh, to quote the castle, it's all about the vibe. Like <laughs> the vibe that that I'm getting from social media and I know social media can be an echo chamber but you know this is I haven't seen this ever really we've got people in WA and networks in WA who are against shark culling and campaigning for a solution here in Queensland Mm. and I genuinely feel that there's a groundswell coming we're seeing um, on the ground communities up on the sunny coast as well taking action and putting out on their social media channels like the Sunshine Coast Environment Council Um, and I should mention another really significant domino that fell was uh, last year, Larry and I from HSI, we went up to a forum on the sunny coast that the council held with department representatives and scientists about and, and all the stakeholders, you know, lifeguards, community reps, everyone going, okay, how can we address the issue of shark bite mitigation in the Noosa biosphere whilst maintaining its environmental values? And again, people were putting forward ideas about non-lethal solutions. Mm. And that was another critical domino that fell. So things are moving in the right direction. I genuinely feel that there's a community groundswell growing. Um, I would not be surprised if there are more demonstrations this year, especially given the fact that there aren't COVID restrictions in terms of gathering in public spaces. And I'm hopeful and confident that if not this year, by next year, there'll be more significant changes. And as I said, it will take time, but we have to keep that pressure on and we will get there and we will see our beaches become safer for bathers, surfers, anyone. Yeah. Um, And not just people, but also safer for wildlife as well. Yeah. I mean, it's got to be done. I mean, in this day and age, um, I mean, you mentioned Western Australia. I mean, they're using non-lethal. The one that I uh, caught my... I actually um, was the, forgive me, I can't remember the name of it now, but it was on uh, Envoy Shark Call and it was the um, kind of the false or man-made weed effect that prevented sharks passing through. I can't understand why 
we can't use something like that instead of nets. Surely that would be, you know, given us given yeah. the answer on both sides of the uh, sides of the. Yeah, and point. look, if not that specific technology, the point is, is that there's innovation. Yeah, we know more. We've got drones. We, we're understanding electroreceptors in sharks better to the mm. point where we've got now two independently scientifically verified personal shark deterrents that work. They're not silver bullets, but it just might be that one instance that, that you know, prevents you from getting a, a really significant injury. Mm. We've got um, wetsuits, which are currently, I think they might still be in protocol stage, but again, they've been scientifically evaluated. It's what Kevlar is to bullets. Mm. You know, it, it, it won't stop you from that blunt trauma, but it just might save your life from bleeding out. So, there's a range of solutions and it's not like they're fanciful or they're 10 years down the track. They're here. They're now. And this is what is incredibly frustrating. Yeah. The fact that we have the solutions, we've got strategies that incorporate education and so forth, yet it's not being comprehensively used. I mean, to give credit to Queensland, they have made significant strides in the past two years and they have made more of an effort in communicating um, beach safety with respect to, to shark interactions. Um, and it's good to see that happening. And, and there are good people in the Queensland government and the department doing amazing work. I have to say that. But from the political standpoint and the decision-making, it's like there's no justification for having drum lines or nets still in the water. Mm. Like anything is an improvement on safety than what we've currently got. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. I mean, I, I see it like it. It's much like a, a rather large tennis court um, with a very small ping pong net in it. It's just pointless. Um, it's, yeah, in terms of, like, like we said, in terms of space, you know, 180 meter net. And I tell everyone, you know, go to the beach, pace out 200 steps, look back from where you started, and then look at the coastline. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, I, I try to, as best as I can to put in perspective for others who perhaps haven't been to the beach or, or, you know, haven't been to a surf beach or have no concept of a shark net or a net for that matter. And I say to them, you know, I go, you know, this safety strategy has been in place for 60 plus years. Mm. So if you went to work, your school, um, your kid's school, your home, your workplace, and they said to you, Oh, our safety standards are, are 60 plus years old. Tell me, are you going to go, what? Like, are you going to accept that or are you going to go, no, no, can we please have modern-day safety standards? Mm. If in the past two years with the coronavirus pandemic, we've asked for improved safety standards for our health in hospitals and in aged care because our lives matter, because our health matters. We want to know that we're safe. Yeah. We don't want the perception of safety. We want to know that we're safe. So why is it that at the beach – we accept these safety standards that are 60 plus years old. Yeah. I'm confident that people don't accept that. The real question is, is to ask the decision makers, the ministers and the politicians, why won't you upgrade safety standards and bring them up to modern day standards? Mm. So again, hopefully that resonates with, with a few others who perhaps um, aren't quite informed about shark or shark nets, but at the very least just want to know that when they go and visit a beach in Queensland or New South Wales for that matter, that, their safety is taken seriously and it's not treated like a game. It's not a perception thing. It's mm. a real thing. Yeah. I think I, I, you touched on a point there of um, lack of knowledge as well. And I think that goes right the way up through from us walking down on the streets to the to people that are new into politics and, and parliament. Um, you know, they can only go on what they're being told by mm. the relevant departments. And, you know, I've, I've experienced that firsthand with, um, with the, with the police here in in New South Wales, um, when a, a rather senior chap was trying to preach to me about nets, and it was it was party line, and I had to stop him in his in his tracks before he, he got a bit out of control. Um, <laughs> but that's another that's another topic, another episode. Um, let's let's come away from that one for a little bit. Um, yeah, where, where and how did you get into diving? Was it that was it the career choice that got you in there, or were you in it before? No, I was in it before. Um, lot, lot, like a lot of people, like everything starts when you're a kid, the things you're most passionate about. And 
I was always, sharks have always been my favourite animal. I've watched National Geographic documentaries. I raided my school library for as many picture books as I could. And believe it or not, this book right here is the one that kicked it off. So this was published in 1986. Um, Who's that one by? This is a Reader's Digest with an introduction by Ron and Valerie Taylor. So 1986. (laughs) And if you get a chance to read it, it just it's a sign of the times. Like there's no mention of anything about threatened animals, conservation. It's just sharks, biology fishing that's it yeah um so books like that i used to just absorb and i was always a science geek love science super curious still am and so i was fortunate enough to marry the two and and as i got older um i grew up in the outer suburbs of melbourne so i didn't grow i didn't grow up by the beach per se Mm. um but again fascination with the ocean and as i got older um i had a mate that i went to school with who did some diving and i said oh i'd love to do that at some point and it was literally just a case of eventually, I think at the age of 21, um, relatively, I'd, I'd say, late getting into diving, um, managed to save up enough cash, got my license um, up in Marimbula mm-hmm. in southern New South Wales, my mate's holiday house, and never looked back. And uh, I've, I reckon I've di- I'm now 37 and I've dived more in the past two years than I had in the years leading up to that. Yeah. Because I was at uni. It's an expensive hobby. I had to work on weekends. All the usual excuses. Um, and, and yeah, I, uh, I, I've had some amazing, amazing experiences. Um, one of my fondest was in South Africa in 2014. So I went there for a big sharks conference. Um, I was on my PhD at the time. Mm-hmm. It's called Sharks International. And it's the massive conference. I have it every four years. And this year, they're doing it in October in Spain, which I'm lucky enough to go to again. <laughs> but anyway, they had, it, um, they had it in South Africa in 2014. And halfway during the conference, they had a, a day break, so a five-day conference. And on the Wednesday, everyone could go out and do guided tours and whatnot. So quite a few people went out on the dive. Yeah. Um, and it was at Aliwal Shoal because they had the conference in Durban. And Aliwal Shoal, you know, I Googled it and YouTubed it before I went and it was, you know, whale sharks, tiger sharks, black tip sharks. Like I was like, oh, I'm hanging. This is going to be awesome. <laughs> um, and so we went out there and we dived with, without a cage on the first one. Well, Aliwal Shoals, there's no cage. Yeah. Um, and these beautiful just black tips, a common black tip sharks, you know, maybe two and a half, three metres long, just buzzing around us. And it was an experience I'll never, ever forget. Like they come right up to you and you've got to kind of like just gently nudge them away. And Was that a bait? It dive? was just, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that baited the water. Um, and then on the second dive that day, uh, they took us to a slightly different spot and they're like, oh, you know, we'll show you some ragged tooths, which is what they call grey nurse sharks. Mm. So we went diving and again, there is, I mean, the viz was absolutely horrible, but <laughs> it was also part of the mystique as well. It was like they just pop up out of the green and, you know, they're there and it was just, yeah. And then had the ragged tooth, you know, I remember sitting on the sea floor, and this ragged tooth just looking at me and it's coming towards me and I can remember doing this like, come, come, it's okay, I'm looking at it. And it was just coming slow and then just veered off. And then me and my dive buddy who was this Mexican fellow, we went, um, swam under this rocky sort of, little overhang as we were coming back up i remember coming up and i looked up to my left and i saw this shadow and it had this blunt nose and i thought oh fuck, that's gonna be a huge tiger shark and i was just pumped and then i'm swimming up and then i go no 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 no, that's way too big and then what it was it was a silhouette of a whale shark coming over the top awesome so i kicked up and i managed to catch the, the side of it but these animals just move so incredibly fast because of their size. One beat at the tail and, and they're gone. Yeah. And so I was buzzing after that. Got back up on the boat and the guy's like, oh, how's the dive? And I said, oh, you're not going to believe me if I told you. And he started laughing. And then I told him, he starts laughing again. He goes, mate, he goes, you've missed the season by about two months. He goes, I don't think you saw what you saw. And I said, I've got it on my freaking GoPro, <laughs> but like I couldn't show him. Um, so yeah, that, that was amazing. And then, and then after that conference finished, I had I went down to um to Cape Town for a couple of days, and that's when I got in a, a cage with a white shark. Yeah, and that was I'm getting goosebumps just remembering it. That was fuck. <laughs> it was this four and a half meter, five meter female, and I remember we're on the boat and we're about to go in in the cage, 
And it was the most interesting experience where I felt instinctive fear. Yeah. And I feel like I'd never felt before. And I caught myself for a split second and I went, oh, that's what that feeling is. Like it's, it's just this instinctive fear. And then I went, Leo, it's okay. You're in a cage. It's all good. Let's go in. And then I went in. And then that fear dissipates. But it was just, it was just, it was your human instinct telling you you are entering a really, really dangerous place. Yeah. Um, but anyway, went in. And, you know, again, the viz is terrible. It's green. But that's what made it amazing. It was like, it was like, you know, when you watch those movies and like a figure appears out of the fog. Mm-hmm. It was like that, but it was this just beautiful white shark just appearing out of this green fog. And she's circling the cage for like 40 minutes and she's big. And the one thing that blew my mind was the size of the tail. So from the top of the tail to the bottom of the tail, the caudal fin, it was like at least seven foot. Like it looked disproportionate to the body. Like it was crazy. This thing is just built for speed. It is a missile. And she's swimming around. And in the whole 45 minutes, she bares her teeth maybe once. Yeah which is amazing because whenever you see white sharks, most people, whenever you see it, it's always an image of their teeth. They're always in attack mode. They're always, you know, vicious. Yet in reality, you're watching this animal and it's just cruising. Yeah. Just, and you watch it past the cage and I've got my GoPro and I have to remind myself to pull my hands in because I'm so excited. I've got to remind myself to pull my hands in just in case. Mm -hmm. And she's coming past the cage, you know, within like 30 centimetres and there's this big, beautiful, like, Per dark purple eye it's like the size of a dinner plate and you can see it move and twist and you know that that animal can see you but you don't know what it's thinking and i'm in the water going what are you thinking i'd love to just peer inside your mind because you can tell it's it's looking at you um and yeah only bare the teeth once and from that experience there like your perception on the animal completely changes because you've seen it in real life books tend to paint it out to be um and you walk away going that is a gentle majestic animal Mm. don't get me wrong a dangerous animal and you don't want to muck around with it but nonetheless majestic and graceful and has every right to exist yeah yeah and it was it was just mind-blowing and then you know i've kept in touch with some scientists over in south africa um, and we can, we can touch on this later with regards to another issue, but um, I've kept in touch with them because Chris Fellows, who's this amazing photographer in, in South Australia, who, uh, South Africa, who was the first person to capture that air jaws where they're leaping out of the water and they're breaching. Oh, yeah. Um, I had a chat with him and he calls me up um, and he goes, we had a chat because he goes, for the past four or five years, so this is in 2020, he goes, you know white sharks in False Bay? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, we actually haven't seen any white sharks in False Bay since 2015. So for those who aren't aware, False Bay is where that seal colony is. It's where I went cage diving. This is where they tow the seals and the sharks breach. Yeah. Um, I said, why? He goes, I suspect that because of unsustainable shark fishing here, so fishing for what they call smooth hound sharks and taupe sharks, they're the same species we also catch in our largest shark fishery in the southern and eastern scale fish and shark fishery. So this is the one that spans New South Wales, wraps around Victoria, South Australia through the WA. Mm-hmm. So we have the gummy shark and the school shark. They have the taupe shark and the smooth hound. The taupe shark is the school shark, it's the name, and the smooth hound is essentially the sister species of a gummy shark. It's same bucket, different colour. Okay. And he said, he goes, I know... I've kept an eye on these fleets. They're fishing within marine parks. You know, they're raping and pillaging the ocean. They're catching all this shark and it's being sent to Australia. I said, what? He goes, yeah. He goes, we know that this shark fishery exports its shark meat. So what Aussies most commonly know as flake Mm -hmm. to Australia. And he goes, from my experience, the, we think that the white shark tends to eat smaller sharks because more numerous in number easier to catch and if they can score a seal they will yeah now there's some there's logic to this because white sharks only have about a 50 percent strike rate when they go hunting seals it's not that high Mm -hmm. they're good at it but it's only 50 percent because those seals are bloody clever and they're bloody fast yeah um and sharks will only hunt in that narrow window um 
of early dawn and sunset because they can use the lack of light to their advantage. Yeah. So he goes, you know, I suspect that between the overfishing, the sharks don't have as much food to eat and they've moved on elsewhere. He goes, because if you go around Garns Bay and Mossel Bay and everything like that, he goes, they're still there. Mm-hmm. And I said to him, I go, what about the killer whales? Because there's a famous case of port and starboard, these oceanic killer whales who come in and were picking off white sharks and were eating their livers. They're like Hannibal Lecter's of the sea. That's the only thing they'd eat <laughs> was just the liver. Yeah. Um, and these white sharks were washing up dead with their livers excised. And again, they had a look at studies and white shark and killer whales can actually scare white sharks off for like a couple of months at a time. Yeah. And he goes, look, he goes, sure. He goes, I don't doubt that that happens. He goes, but you're talking a rap. He goes, that's a relative blip. He goes, we're looking at multiple years of no white sharks and we don't know why. Mm-hmm. He goes, the only thing I can think of is because of the severe overfishing, it's affecting the ecosystem here in South Africa's waters. I said, hmm, okay, I'll have a look at the Australian side of things. So I had a look at the Australian side of things. And whilst there's no definitive evidence as such, if you have a look at the trade records, coincidentally, from 2015 through to now, year on year, it doubled, and by now it's about tripled, where Australia's importing shark meat or shark products from South Africa. Mm. It's coincidental it's at the same time, and most of Australia's shark meat and shark products actually comes from New Zealand, the vast majority of it. But other than New Zealand, the next country, bang, South Africa, just out of nowhere, just these imports come in. Yeah. Now, admittedly, it is coincidental, um, but there's enough there to go... And I was, I was speaking to Enrico Gennari, who's a scientist over in South Africa who has studied white sharks. Admittedly, there's enough clues to go something's going on here and you'd be naive to think that overfishing wasn't part of the problem. Yeah. So from my end, with my work looking at sustainable fisheries in Australia, uh, looking at shark conservation through the lens of sustainable fishing in Australia, I start putting this together and going, so hold on, so... Australia is happy to claim, claim, you know, that we're clean and green and we're the world's best fisheries and we're all sustainable brand Australia. Mm-hmm. Yet we've got no problems supporting unsustainable fishing practices in South Africa that are well that are driving two species to extinction because the smooth hound and the taupe shark in South Africa are endangered. So we are eating or importing these endangered sharks. Mm-hmm. So we're happy to support that fishery, which is driving these sharks to extinction, we're happy to eat those endangered sharks and we're affecting an an entire tourism operation in South Africa, so much so that if you ring up the cage divers in False Bay now and even if you look at the websites, they've kind of shifted their marketing to shark experiences where you're looking at broad-nosed seven gills and a few other shark species because the white sharks just aren't there. Yeah. So we're affecting the tourism industry, we're affecting the ecology, we're affecting species driving them to extinction importing them over to Australia and we're happy to do that. And I was like, no, this, this doesn't cut the mustard. Mm. Even if you take out the equation, white sharks disappearing from South Africa, this does not cut the mustard. Something's wrong here. And so part of the work that I do is going, okay, Australian fisheries need to lift their game because we've got some serious problems in our own backyard. And part of those problems is, is we can't be a pot calling the kettle black. Mm. Sure, relative to the rest of the world, our fisheries are in a relatively good position because we're a well-resourced country, relatively low historical fishing pressure, but that does not mean we don't have problems. However, that being said, as a quote-unquote leading nation, we should not be supporting unsustainable fishing practices elsewhere, and that speaks to seafood imports, seafood labelling, and how we go about it. Mm. So... Yeah, it's a long-winded way of saying that Australia's fisheries need some serious fixing up when it comes to sharks and rays, uh, and that's what what my work entails. Mm. Have you um, just just on the the import export thing though? Have you, have you come across um, of the import and export of, of shark fin at all? I'm just thinking back to um, Brendan and Liz at Shark Guardian. They they took on Parliament in mm. the UK um, with the legal importation of, of people being able to take it through in hand luggage is it yeah so so you'd be i don't know if you'd be surprised because you might you might be quite well informed but it's perfectly legal to import and export shark fin mm. there's nothing illegal about it 
Australia trades in shark fin. There's nothing illegal about it. Yeah. What is illegal is shark finning. And that is where you're cutting the fins off and you're dumping the body. But there's nothing illegal about getting a shark, cutting the fins off, using the meat and the fins and then trading in it. Yeah. Um, so that's that there. I'm sorry, do you mind repeating the question? I don't know if I've answered it or if I've just gone off on a tangent again. That's all right. Just if it was, um, if there was any similarities with, I know they had um, limitations on what individuals could bring into the UK. Ah, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah. Yeah. So with our import and exports, um, I suppose the best place to start is. With a concept that's called fin, with a concept that's called fins, ah, sorry, with a concept um, or a management tool that's called fins naturally attached. Okay. Now, what this is, it means that if any shark is harvested, its fins, by the time it gets to land, by the time it's landed on land back to port, it has to come back in one piece essentially with its fins on, i.e., fins naturally attached. The reason for this is there's a few reasons. One, it obviously is a practical safeguard against illegal shark finning because you can't separate the fins from the body. Mm -hmm. Two, it helps fishery managers identify what species are being caught and in what numbers because once you start removing fins from a shark body, species become very hard to identify. Yeah. So the size of the fins relative to each other and their position on the body and their shape is one of the morphological features we use to identify sharks, particularly when you're looking at whaler species that all have that characteristic shark shape that all look similar mm. so species id helps managers know what species are being caught where and how many that then goes into broader management so that we can have sustainable fisheries thirdly it stops endangered species from being caught because that speaks to being able to identify the species so if someone brings a shark back with fins naturally attached and the fisheries officer goes okay i'm going to check your your catch hold on that's an endangered species that's protected by law you shouldn't have that mm -hmm. he can spot it or she can spot it. But without fins naturally attached, if you're able to mix up your fins and flesh, you'd never know. Yeah. So in a nutshell, stops illegal live finning. Um, sharks come back in one piece. You can ID the species and prevent endangered species from entering the trade. Now, I mentioned that because when we start looking at imports and exports, this is what Canada did. Um, I think the UK followed the same model. I'd have to double check, but this is definitely what Canada did. And what they did is they said that for any imports and exports, you have to have fins naturally attached. Now, what that, that disincentivizes trade in shark fins because all of a sudden, if you want to export shark fin, you have to export an entire carcass. Yeah. So that's weight, that's space, and a shitload of money to do so. Mm. So the question is, do you really want to do it? Conversely, if you want to import shark fin, you're going to have to pay for a consignment of shark carcasses with their fins attached. Again costs, so on and so forth, do you really want to do it? So it's kind of an economic disincentive. Mm. Um, that the, it's quite a practical workaround and quite a practical solution. The other thing in theory is that with fisheries that have fins naturally attached, um, there is the argument, and this is going to be very controversial to say, but hear me out, there is the argument that you could have a sustainable fin trade. And by that I mean is that, and again, this is in theory, is that let's say you have a fishery where it catches a shark species that reproduces relatively fast. You've got a good handle of its biology, its stock. You know what numbers can be caught without depleting the population. And on top of that, the way you fish, it doesn't impact the broader environment. So, you know, dolphins, dugongs, so on and so forth. But for simplicity's sake, let's just say that you've got a shark. It's sustainable by any measures. You're not impacting the population. The theory goes with fins naturally attached is that you're harvesting this shark sustainably. You're using it in its entirety. It's not being wasted. Um, if you're using it for meat, well, then why wouldn't you use the fins? You then export the fins and, you know, it's from a fishery that's traced as fins naturally attached. Everything's above board. Arguably, you could charge a premium for that product. And then again, in theory, because you're charging a premium for that product, because it is sustainable, that money should then go into improving fisheries management even better and even helping threatened species recover in number. Mm. Again, that's theory. Um, that's currently what's accepted scientifically as best practice because short of that, what do you do? Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of arguments, you know, for and against. 
But suffice to say that fins naturally attached in fisheries is the best practical tool we have at the moment to prevent live finning. Um, in Australia, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Western Australia is the only jurisdiction in the country that doesn't have it. Yeah. And Western Australia has Australia's second largest shark fishery that catches gummy sharks, school sharks, and, and hammerhead species. And they don't have it. However, thanks to, thanks to our campaigning and the support of the broader public, the government's made a commitment that by the end of this year they will have it. So I'm actually in discussions now with WA to kind of see where they're at and how they're progressing. Um, but fingers crossed that come the end of this year, they'll actually have it in place. Queensland doesn't have it in their Gulf of Carpentaria fishery. So Queensland's very north. If you look at the Cape, decide to head west into that Gulf. That fishery there does not have fins naturally attached and they still catch a shitload of shark with nets, including endangered scallop hammerhead and no fins naturally attached. Queensland, however, does have it on its east coast fishery. The point I'm getting at is that Australia is patchwork. Its anti-finning regulations aren't up to scratch and they're not consistent. Mm. And so what this means is that in the Gulf, for example, if a fisher wanted to illegally fin an animal or high grade his product, he could and be none the wiser. Because an example would be scalloped hammerhead, for example. So scalloped hammerhead endangered in Australian waters, yet can still legally be harvested and palmed off to your fish and chip shop and marketed as slake. Yeah. There's nothing illegal about it. You could be eating endangered shark and you wouldn't even know it. But let's just say a fisher goes out there. And I should preface this with the fact that this isn't all fishers because there are some bloody good fishers out there who do give a shit about the work they do yeah. environmentally and want it to continue in the future. But at the same time, there are also ones out there, like in any industry, that are cowboys and don't give a shit. Yeah. They just want to make money now and that's it. So let's just say this bad fisher, so to speak, one of the, one of the, raw, one of the rotten eggs, wants to or goes out catches his sharks, and on his boat, because there's no fins actually attached, cuts the fins off, puts it in one pile, dices the flesh up, flesh up, puts it in another pile. And so long as those piles are in about a 5% ratio, according to the law, he's okay. What do you mean a 5% ratio? Ah, good question. So, so long as the weight, the weight of the fins is 5% of the total weight of the flesh, okay. he's okay. The rationale behind that is that, as a general rule of thumb, um, the weight of a shark's fin is 5% of its body mass. Okay. Well, that's not the case because they've done numerous studies afterwards to kind of work out this thing and you've got species where the ratios are way off. You've got some species where I think like an oceanic white tip or maybe a few others where, you know, the weight ratio is like maybe 8 9% and you've yeah. got some where the ratio is 1%. So the moral of the story is that 5% is somewhat arbitrary. Hmm. Um. So anyway, so long as he's got his pile of flesh and his pile of fins and within that ratio, he goes, yeah, I'm sweet, no worries. But let's say he pulls up his net and he pulls up this huge, mature, scalloped or great hammerhead. Now, hammerhead, hammerhead fins are one of the most prized on the market. Yeah. And he goes, Fuck, I can't let these five, $600 fins off the boat. Yeah. He cuts the fins off, dumps the body, and what he does is in his pile of fins, to keep the weight ratio up, he throws out some of the smaller shitter ones yeah. that aren't going to fetch as much money. That's high grading. It's like, if a fish, it's like if anyone went out and they caught small fish and then later on on their way home, they caught bigger fish and they threw out the small fish. That's yeah. what they call high grading. So he's done that with fins and he's finned a shark and he's done something illegal. And there's no way of knowing because A, in Queensland fisheries, there's no independent monitoring and in WA fisheries, there's, sorry, in the WA shark fishery as well, and in Queensland fisheries entirely, there's no independent monitoring. So there's no way of knowing what actually happens out at sea. And it hasn't been like that since 2012. So it's just, so, it's just mouth music when they report that they're, you know, doing yeah, all the good stuff. Yeah, you're taking you're trusting that what they put in the books is true. <clears throat> and so in short, this guy's pulled up his hammerhead, cut the fins off, high-graded it. Now, again, I stress this is if a, this is if a fisher wanted to do something illegal mm. and with no one watching him. And comes back to port, fishing officer comes up, goes, let me have a look at your catch. He goes, sure, no worries. Fisher officer has got no idea of how to identify the sharks because there's a pile of fins and a pile of flesh. Yeah. Tell me, are you going to go pick through each one and try and – you can't. It's impractical. But he goes, you know what, 
all right, what are the weights? Yeah, you're within the ratio. No worries. Off you go. Yeah. If you had fins naturally attached, there's no way that would have been able to happen. So with fins naturally attached, even though there isn't independent monitoring, any shark that he brings back has to essentially be in one piece. Yeah. So there's no way he's going to bring back um, any protected species or anything like that because he'll get caught. But then wouldn't there also be the argument that if he catches the big-ass scalloped hammerhead uh, and we're operating under the fins attached bit, that he doesn't just chuck out a shit ton of the smaller? Yeah, and and in that case there, despite the fact that it's an endangered animal but can still be legally caught, sure, he hasn't broken the rule by catching a scalloped hammerhead and bringing it back, but he couldn't fin it, he couldn't dump it, and if he did want to bring it, that's going to chew up his holding space, Mm. so he's perhaps going to fish less. So... From a practical standpoint, fins naturally attached is world's best practice in sustainable fisheries management, yeah. whether you're a shark fisher or not, because the reality is even in a tuna longline fishery, you're going to catch pelagic sharks. Yeah. In some trawl fisheries, you're going to catch sharks, and some of those sharks are byproduct. They're kept for their fins and their flesh. Yeah. And so fins naturally attached just ensures that from a very practical perspective, we know what's getting caught, we know what species are getting caught, and even from a marketing perspective or a consumption perspective, the animal isn't getting wasted. Um, and obviously people can have their, their ethical views on that. That's, in, that's entirely within their rights. Um, but, yeah, in Australia, WA is the only jurisdiction that does not have it in any of their fisheries, let alone their major shark fishery. Mm. I am optimistic and I am trusting that they will have it in place by the end of the year, but we're still waiting to see that. But the good news is that they have made that commitment. That's, yeah. that's the good news. Um, so yeah, that's that's just from the, the fin side of things, but um, it is a bit of a misconception globally that finning is driving the decline in sharks. So WWF WWF did a global study um, with a few scientists, and they released I think last year, and it's clear that what's actually driving the decline in sharks in terms of fishing is the meat. Mm-hmm. So whilst the meat per kilo is worth less than fin, right? In terms of volume and market demand, it's the meat that's getting sold. Yeah. And this so we've got, meat we, from- so we, we've got all this finger pointing towards the Far East wanting fins all the time when actually it's much more than the Far East. It's, it's countries like Australia and England that are using that meat as, as you know, like you say, down the fish and it's, chip shop. It's, it's, it's everyone. Like you can't mm. really point the finger at, at, at any individual. Yeah. Um, sure, the biggest fin trade market is in Southeast Asia, but I'm not going to go and say that because, frankly, it's racist, but I'm not going to go and say that, oh, Southeast Asia that's driving the decline in sharks and rays across the world because of the fin trade. It's not true. It's the demand for meat. And what we have to realise is is that that demand for meat goes to service poor nations because shark meat is generally the cheapest meat because in some cases we've perhaps overfished what was traditionally targeted. So we fall back to shark meat, which is historically, generally speaking, less desirable to eat. And it's not as marketable. It's not as worthy per kilo. So the demand is largely meat through the rest of the world, not fins. Fins is, if you want to call it, a bit of a byproduct. Mm -hmm. But again, that's not to say that finning doesn't occur, that people don't kill sharks because the fins are valuable. That does happen too. But overall, the main driver is the meat, not the fins. But suffice to say, they're both problems nonetheless. Mm. And the other really important thing that that people should be aware of um, in terms of pointing fingers and who's to blame for declines and whatnot is just to be a bit culturally aware. And by that, I mean that particularly in a lot of the Southeast Asian countries and fishing nations where fish is pretty much their only source of reliable protein. And culturally, fishing has been around for thousands of years in their cultures. They have an inherent understanding of the value of fish to their cultures, and they respect the sea as such, but there's also modern-day real-world pressures. So I'll never, ever forget, and again, this goes back to that South Africa conference where this, this woman got up and she was speaking about her research. From memory, it was in Indonesia. And part of her research was looking at the human side of shark fishing, what that meant for conservation. And I'll never, ever forget it because it was the first time that I went, oh, shit, I never 
thought of that. And that was, she said, these shark fishermen in Indonesia know how important sharks are to their ecosystem. They know how important sharks are to their culture, to their belief systems, to everything. Mm. But they're faced with the very real world problem of how do I feed my family? Mm -hmm. How do I go out on these boats for days, if not weeks at a time, maybe months, and come back with nothing? when all I can come back with is shark meat, or at least that's the majority of what I can come back with. Yeah. Or I come back with the fins because uh, <laughs> it's going to get me money. And I can, it's a very real problem yeah. um, and a very wicked problem. And so that's when I went, geez, like you can't just be a quote unquote raving greenie. Not that I wanted to be, but I was just like, you've got to realize there's a human element here. You've got to have um, balance. It's got to be on balance. And you've got to have balance. Now, in Australia, it's it's a bit trickier because, you know, the situation's not that dire, to be quite frank. Mm. Um, sure, whenever you're looking at fisheries management, it impacts livelihoods, sure. Um, but at the same time, you know, I look at it from the perspective of I want to see a healthy ocean. Mm -hmm. I like fishing to eat. I actually wouldn't mind trying to spear a fish. I, I just started free diving not long ago. Again, for my own personal consumption, I've got nothing against it. I completely understand it. It just goes back to that point where fishing is a responsibility, not a right. Just yeah. don't be a dick when you do it. Yeah. Um, and so when you're looking at fisheries management, and I'm involved in a lot of working groups, I speak to a lot of commercial fishers in these groups, you know, and that cracks at me saying, oh, you know, you want to destroy fishing in Australia, you know, you want to destroy jobs. And I get that sentiment. But at the same time, I started to go, mate, I go, I want to make sure that what's out there is out there for everyone, including yourself. Because the rate we're going in this particular fishery, mate, you're going to struggle in the next few years. You're struggling now according to these stock assessments. Mm. Um, but again, that's just the typical argy-bargy. But the point being is that within these working groups, there is balance and I'm on the side of making sure that these oceans are healthy and that our sharks and rays are protected and they're not driven to declines, they're not driven to extinction, so that sustainable, true, environmentally sustainable fishing can occur. Um, and what I'm really proud of is that AMCS, so the Australian Marine Conservation Society that I work for, we've got a program called the Good Fish Program, which is our independent sustainable seafood guide. And... We look at sustainability from a holistic perspective. So it's not just the number of a given fish. It's also about when you catch that fish, sure, its numbers might be great, but what's the impact on seals, on dolphins, on the habitat, on the environment, so on and so forth. And we then rate that product with a traffic light system. So green is, yep, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Orange is eat less and red is avoid. Yeah, And so... I'm proud to say that there are some fish, there are fish stocks and there are fisheries where we've greenlisted them. Um, we recently greenlisted, uh, I had to double check if it was green or amber, but suffice to say, we recently showcased a line fisher in the Great Barrier Reef who fishes for coral trout. Hmm. Now, this bloke catches fish with a hand line and he can tell the size to some extent what fish just by the twitch of the line, yeah. just through lived experience. And it's one fish at a time, comes up in good nick. If he catches one, he's not meant to catch. Because it's in good nick, he can throw it back. You know, it's going to survive. So there are ways of doing things. Mm. It just comes down to the fact that we've got to get over this idea that we can have what we want, when we want, and however we want it. Yeah. I think those days are long and truly gone. Um, so I'm really proud that, that, that we do that, that we look at conservation and we're bringing everyone on board for the ride. If you're a vegan, amazing. You've been able to make that choice. You've been able to support that lifestyle, all the power to you. And I mean that genuinely. If you're a red-blooded carnivore, great. We just hope that you make your choices as informed as possible. Mm. And that's where the good fish guide comes in. For some people, you know, I want to eat seafood for the rest of my life. But all right, here's an informed choice so that you can enjoy seafood. But let's enjoy it so that the environment's actually benefiting as well. Yeah. Then there are people who are on the journey. And I would include myself in this where our relationship with seafood has drastically changed. I grew up or I've grown up in an Italian family where seafood is just common fare. Um, 
And I've grown up now, my family knows that, and even people I go out with, like for me to eat seafood when I go out, I am so picky, it's not funny. <laughs> Unless I know what it is, where it's from and how it's caught, I just don't touch it. Yeah. But I don't judge anyone else at the same time. If they ask me why, I say, well, all right, let's have a conversation. And they might walk away and change their mind. I don't know. But the great thing is, is that for people where their relationship's changing and they're on this journey, again, being informed with our sustainable seafood guide is a way to go, okay, I'm thinking of going vegan or I'm thinking of being vegetarian. I suppose like a drug, I want to wean myself off. If I'm going to wean myself off. I'll start with small achievable goals. And that might be, I'll only eat a green listed species. Yeah. And then down the track, I might realize, well, shit, I actually don't really eat that much seafood anymore. Fuck it. I just won't eat seafood. <laughs> and I'll admit, like, I think I'm actually starting to head down that track. And that's only because I'm so picky with what I eat now in terms of seafood that I've realized I can't even remember the last time I ate seafood. And then I go, has the quality of my life really changed? Hmm, not really. Still eat a pretty balanced diet, still pretty healthy, still pretty fit, have good friends, have good family. Eh, life's good. Yeah. But again, I say that coming from a very fortunate position. Um, fortunate position in terms of, you know, job security, a wage, education, and so forth. So yeah. we're not all cut from the same cloth in that respect. And it's going to take horses for courses to to bring everyone on this journey to really improve the health of our oceans. Yeah. And it, it, it's the sustainability element that you were touching on there. You know, the, the guy that's on his fishing line or, you know, the locals that I used to live with in Papua New Guinea going out on the canoes, single lines and, and, and catching what they can. And it, it's very small quantities in comparison to what's out there. It's the huge trawlers that are making the millions of dollars and catching tons upon tons upon tons leaving it in a freezer offshore and then shipping it across that's the bit that needs to be controlled that's the bit that we need to yeah. get a grip of yeah yeah there, there's there's a lot of problems globally um and, and it's tricky because there's a lot of problems that i genuinely would love to help solve mm. or be really really full-blown involved with but there's enough to bite into just in australia alone um so Australia's our focus and my focus at the moment, and there are some international components to it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm not going to stop until I die, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really call this work; it's what I do. It's what you do. It's a, it's a passion, isn't it? And if you, yeah, if you can do your passion every day, then you know there's only going to be some good come from it somehow. And I think you're well on the oh, way with that. There, there, there is, mate. Um, and like, even when you follow your passion, you have shit days. You have days yeah. where you're like, "Fuck, why do I do this?" Like, <laughs> that's life. You'd, be, you'd be naive to think it's all going to be roses. But the point is, is like when you're doing your passion, like you're willing to put up with it. Yeah. In, when you have those moments, but the good stuff, the best stuff that happens, and it genuinely puts wind in your sails, and it's happened a few times, is when you get a letter from a kid. And they've taken the time to sit down and write this letter. And some of the things they say are hilarious because it's just, like they say, from the mouth of babes, it's just cold truth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> shark fishing should never happen. And sharks aren't mean. They're nice. And thank you so much for, for making me learn about this. And I really want to save sharks. And some kids have actually gone like they've donated money from their birthdays. They've, they've saved up money to donate to help save sharks. And I look, I look at that and I go, it, it, they inspire me. They motivate me, mm. not the other way around. Um, and it just demonstrates that no matter what you do, whether you're a conservationist, whether you're a diver, whether you're an electrician, or whether you're a builder, whatever, like don't for a moment think that you don't have impact on people around you. Um, and I think if you can make yourself conscious of that as much as you can, then it, it's enriching. It, it makes you want to be better, to do better, regardless of what your trade is. Um, and in my case, when I get those letters or when I'm given an opportunity to speak to a school um, and kids get really excited, it reminds me of when I was a kid and I now am fortunate enough to be in this position to give back. And what I give back, they give to me tenfold. Yeah. Um, and it's, they're the wins that I really cherish because the conservation wins, particularly with marine conservation, they're few and far between. You fail more than you win. And when you do get those wins, they can literally take years to happen. 
yeah. as we discussed earlier with shark culling, with fisheries management. Like I've been doing this for four or five years now. And in the four or five years, I'm hoping that by the end of this year, WA puts fins naturally attached in. Um, so it's a long road and you take the wins where you can get them, no matter how small they are. And I suppose that just speaks to a life lesson in general. Yeah. Yeah, just a bit. <laughs> so where, where, do you, where do you think we're going with, you know, let's, let's put a prediction. What's, that, what's going to happen with, uh, in, in Dr. Leo's head, what's going to happen with sharks in Australia over the next 10 years? Over the next 10 years? Whoa, good question. There's a big one for you. That's a big one. So the next 10 years will be 2037. No, 2037, 2032. Yeah. Um, wow. I don't know because there's so many factors. Like even if you took fishing out of the equation, climate change is a big one. Yeah. And that's affecting sharks in a big way. Yeah. Um, oh, well, look, all right, let's – it might be hard to say – all right, let, let's look at this one. Let's play the, because I actually was involved in a study on this. Um, so we have some indication of what sharks are going to be doing in the next 10 years or so, at least by the end of the century mm-hmm. uh, with climate change. So what you'll see or what we'll probably see in terms of movement is we'll see sharks literally pushed into a corner. So we'll have tropical species and subtropical species like bull sharks, tiger sharks, um, making their way further south into Australia. Okay. Uh, they've already noticed this with bull sharks as well. So they'll head further and further south, particularly down the east coast. And the reason being is you've got that east Australian current that brings warm water from the tropics down. Yeah. That's extending year on year and getting stronger year on year. And when you go down to the bottom of Australia, like that Victorian kind of Tasmanian intersection, that's a global warming hotspot. The water there is heating at four times the global average. Holy shit. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's happening is you're getting these tropical species moving down in terms of sharks, which are then pushing your more subtrop temperate species, your cold water species. They're getting pushed, according to the modelling, say, from Vic down into South Australia Mm -hmm. because they can't go further south because there's a continental shelf. Yeah. So not all sharks can just live in water because it's deep. Like, they have depth limits as well based on habitat requirements and so forth. But generally speaking, once you get to the shelf, it's kind of like, oh, we've got to stop here. We've got to change direction. So they can only go so far south and then they've got to go west. So they're going to head west into South Australia. Yeah. You look at the west coast of Australia, it's going to be almost similar kind of thing. Warm water is going to come further south, more or less. And then what's going to happen is you're going to have this kind of contraction where there's this concentration in South Australia or they're in that kind of Great Australia Bight region. Mm. They can only go so far and they can only move in so many directions. That's just in terms of, I suppose, temperature and habitat. You've then got to look at all of a sudden you're going to get more interactions with species that never really had to worry about each other before. So all of a sudden you might get increased levels of predation on gummy sharks by tiger sharks. Mm. What does that mean for the ecosystem? What does it mean if tiger sharks are now starting to, I don't know, smash Australia's silk colony of Phillip Island yeah. or start smashing little penguins? What does that mean? Um, these are all plausible scenarios. And the nuts and bolts of it is, is tropical species are going to move further south into cooler waters. What that means for the ecosystem, we don't know. And what that means for the dynamics, we don't know. CSIRO, so CSIRO, Australia's leading sort of scientific body, they did some studies from a fishery perspective looking at the abundance of certain fish and how they might change as climate change or global warming increases. And when they looked at gummy shark and school shark, the two primary target shark species in southern Australia, or sorry, I should say gummy shark is the primary target species in southern parts of Australia, School shark is bycatch, but it's endangered and can still legally be sold. Again, another story. Mm-hmm. But they had a look at those two species because they're commercially important one way or another. And their productivity, I think, from memory is expected to decline by 20% because of warming waters alone. That wasn't even factoring in fishing pressure changes, interactions with other species. Because you can only measure and predict so much. Like You can't throw everything in. It just becomes a mess. Yeah. So... In the next 10 years to the end of the century, we, 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 well, we are seeing shifts, pure and simple. We are seeing shifts. Mm. Um, a few years back, you had the odd sighting of a manta ray off the coast of Tassie, you know, and really? hammerheads off the coast of Tassie. 
yeah, this is going back, I think maybe I want to say six to eight years ago. Now you do get vagrants like species that just wander off track, so to speak outside their range. Yeah. But this is happening more and more given the warming water currents coming down. Um, I mean, those magical kelp forests in the Bass Strait or around Tassie, about 90% of them, I think, are gone or more or less disappearing because of you've got urchins coming in with the warmer water from the north mm-hmm. and urchins are just smashing kelp. Yeah. And then on top of that, you've got warming waters as well. Um, so there's a lot of things happening. So it's really hard to predict what's going to happen <clears throat> in the next 10 to, to 50 years or so. From a fishing perspective, uh, to be honest, I couldn't tell you. Um, what we try and focus on, what we try and do is both the immediate problems and probably the safest thing to do is look ahead in five-year brackets. Mm. So I say five-year brackets because it's ample time for, you know, between government processes, changing industry regulations, getting stuff on the water to happen, technologies, research, kind of all happens within five-year windows. And generally speaking, best practices is that when fisheries do an environmental risk assessment, so when they assess the overall snapshot of the fishery and what's going on to what species and what species are at high risk and should be mitigated and what species are at low risk and fine, that, in theory, best practice should happen anywhere between every two to five years. So that's enough time to capture changes in the environment. It's enough time to capture changes in management, changes in law. Um, and even changes in social attitudes as well. So, yeah, predicting 10 plus years out is really hard. Um, But if we look at five years' time, we'll put it this way. By 2024, we've managed to secure commitments from Australia's largest fishery. So that's the the CESF that I mentioned earlier, the Southern and Eastern Scale Fish and Shark Fishery. Mm -hmm. Secure commitments from WA um, as well and secure commitments for Queensland that by 2024, there should be independent monitoring in their fisheries. Um, And that's a fundamental to any form of sustainable management because it means not only, you know, do we have accurate reporting, but the data we get is accurate, it's more robust, so that we can better fine-tune our management so that we're not forced to use these big, broad strokes and rules, which everyone complains about. Well, it's like, well, you're complaining about it and you're complaining that there's not enough data and the data's not good enough and that you want more data, well, then why the fuck were you against independent monitoring in the first place? This is what it's for. Yeah. So when the roost, when, when, the, when it comes home to roost and all these problems occur, it's like, mm, it's frustrating. So, but yeah, in the next, by 2024, we're hoping to have independent monitoring across a lot of Australia's high-risk fisheries. And then after about two years of that, once the data comes in, we'll get a real picture of what's happening with target fish that we sell for seafood, but we also get a better picture of what's happening with threatened endangered species and the numbers that are being caught in because there's underreporting is just rife, yeah. particularly in Queensland. And so that takes us to, what, 2026? So then hopefully by 2030 we've gone, okay, in the next eight years we've got all this information like, Let's fix what we haven't fixed previously. Yeah. That's me being overly simplistic, but that's the best way I can put it because it's always a moving feast. Throw in the complications of climate change, throw in rotating governments. Um, the best you can do is just uh, just keep up the good fight and make sure you make those incremental improvements over time. Well, as soon as you uh, thought that was going to be a struggle to answer a 10-year window... I think you've done it bloody well, mate. <laughs> you covered everything there. <laughs> uh, oh, I tried. <laughs> Good on you. Good on you. And what's um, well? That's that's what's uh, that's what predicted for the sharks and the fishies. What's what's the prediction for Doctor Leo? What are you going to do for the next ten years? More of the same. Next ten years. Oh, I love this. Um, <laughs> well, I'll definitely be at AMCS for at least the next two years, uh, doing the shark campaign, dedicated shark campaign there. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't mind down the track dabbling in international trade, mm-hmm. um, probably pivoting into international trade of shark products. And then with that experience, maybe further down the track, just international trade in seafood and fisheries in general. Um, that's very loose. But to be really honest, and I've had a few people ask me this question, you know, like, oh, so what do you plan to do in the next five years? Where do you think this is taking you? 
I genuinely feel like I'm where I'm meant to be. Yeah. Um, I feel like I have the privilege and the luxury of now just being able to enjoy the ride. So I, I did my university studies. I did my PhD. And after I finished my PhD in 2016, and that was studying sharks and rays, um, you know, for two years I was soul searching because, you know, I was managing a bar full time. And I was like, I didn't do this to manage a bar full time. Like, don't get me wrong. I love the cocktails and I love the pretty ladies that come in. And, but, you know, I want to be a, I want to be a shark scientist. I want to work with sharks. Yeah. Um, in 2018, when I started with AMCS, you know, my PhD, quote unquote, paid off. It gave me street cred, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so I'm not just a conservationist, but working in shark conservation, but I've got a doctorate. Like, I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I've got the networks. Like, you know, opponents can say that I'm a raving greenie as much as they want. I go, mate, I know what I'm talking about, pure and simple. Yeah. Um, they really want to push my buttons. And I, I won't lie, I do love the odd argy bargy. <laughs> um, you don't get, get those boxing but, gloves on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did that once. That was fun. Um, but, um, but yeah, I feel like I'm where I'm, ne- I'm meant to be. And at the risk of tooting my own horn, like I feel like on, on a personal level, very fulfilled and like I've arrived. Yeah. I've, I'm at the place where I wanted to be when I was a kid. I am a shark scientist and I'm saving sharks. And what's better is I have all these amazing opportunities to talk to people about it, to, to you know, to be in the newspapers, to, to talk about it on TV, to be on podcasts like this with yourself. I mean, all these amazing people in these, the free diving community, the diving community, scientists. It's just, it's not just the fact that I've been lucky enough to follow a dream and live it. It's, I feel like I'm reaping the rewards only just now. And that is... And it's not the financial rewards. It's not that at all. It's my work is fulfilling. I feel like I'm impacting in a positive way the environment and people's lives. But not just that, but the amazing people and opportunities that I've gotten to meet, that, I, that I've gotten to experience and will experience. Yeah. Um, and the best, best, best part is, like I said before, is being able to give back. Um, that is the most fulfilling part. So... I'm lucky to just right now, I think it's a very fortunate position in life um, where I can just enjoy the ride. I don't, there's no other rung on the ladder to climb. Like yeah. I'm here and I can just enjoy the ride and be able to take or pick and choose what opportunities come my way and see what might be. Um, it's just crazy. The only, I'm a competitive person by nature, but the only competition I feel at the moment is just within myself and that is to quite literally be a better person tomorrow than I was today and the way in which I do that is through my shark conservation work and bringing people along the journey with me yeah and it's, it's people like the, you that brings that information to people that are unaware and that's the big thing in all of this shimozzle of what you know the world is right now it's information and people's mm. lack of information. And we combine the two uh, through people like yourself that are well-informed. And it, um, it opens people's eyes, makes it a brighter day. Oh, thank you. And at, and at the risk of going down a rabbit hole, the other problem is, is that there's so much information that um, there is a real challenge of people in general having the skills to critically think mm. about what information is accurate and does it come from a reputable source? A oh, mate, I, source. I saw it on TikTok. It's fact. I see it, you know, it, <laughs> that, that dude was on TikTok. He was wearing a doctor's <laughs> stethoscope. It's a fact. You know, you've got to drink yeah. water with lemon in the morning to lose 10 kilos a day. Done. How's that going for you? <laughs> I mean, you look great. Don't get me wrong, you look great. Oh, yeah, I could do with losing another 20 kilos, mind. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah that that's that's definitely a challenging one and look i don't think it's anyone's fault per se it's just we're bombarded with so much information that it becomes reinforcing and you, you live in your own little bubble and that is your world yeah and there's you know any psychologist will tell you that you get reinforced information from your own little bubble and you literally see that as the world like that is what's happening um which is why you can't you can't argue or convince people with facts alone. Yeah. If we did that, well, shit, <laughs> climate change wouldn't be a thing. We'd be fine. 
Yeah. So it's it really is a challenge where you've actually got to empathize with people, understand their values, their worldview, and try and sort of communicate through that and then drop the facts in. Um, and that's and that's an art form. It's something I'm learning because coming straight out of academia, it's very much dry, here are the facts, therefore this should happen. Yeah. That doesn't work in the real world, so to speak. In the real world, it's like so many different competing interests and so many different points of view. You've got to try and find the value that speaks to a certain person and, and work through that. So if I'm talking to a commercial fisher, there's no point me saying, oh, sharks are declining at such a rate. I've got to go, okay, mate, how can we work this out where you can have a profitable business into the future and I can improve your social licensing and marketability because you're taking every step possible to reduce interactions with threatened species? Yeah. All of a sudden we're having a conversation about conservation without talking about conservation. Mm. Whereas, you know, if I'm going to speak to a bunch of primary school kids, yeah, I'm going to drop all these cool, amazing facts and big numbers because, shit, that's really interesting. Wow, I didn't know that. I'm going to go home and tell mum and dad. Versus if I'm talking to someone at the pub, you know, I'm going to get them to speak to me and then work out what their interests are and go, hey, let me show you this awesome photographer on Instagram. How mad are these pictures? Or you know, check this out. And then through that aesthetic input, it's like, oh, why is that like that? Well, all right, let me tell you about this particular place in the world and why it's like this. Mm-hmm. So it's speaking through different values and dropping the facts in bit by bit. Um, yeah, that's that's the best way to convince someone. But, again, it can be used for powers of good or powers of evil. Yeah. Um, well, thankfully, you're doing the good bits, not the bad bits. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank hey, um, one thing before we round up, I have to round up. Yep. I've, I've literally, I'm flying out on Sunday to Indonesia and um, had my lunch before oh, this nice. show, and I've, um, I've, I've chewed a filling out of my face. So I've got to run to the dentist in about half an hour, forty five minutes, or whatever. Um, so before I bugger off, um, yep. I've always, I've been chasing this information for a number of years now. Um, leucistic hammerheads. Do you know of any location in the world where you can see leucistic hammerheads? <laughs> no. Because I do. I, I do you? Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know if you want to divulge your secrets over a podcast, but I'd be definitely keen to know because hammerheads are on my bucket list. Really? To go dive with. Yeah. I've seen, them, I've seen them on the end of a fishing line, but not underwater free swimming. They're on my bucket list. We should. We'll talk after the show because I'm I'm reopening my uh, my travel agency as well. So maybe we could organise a trip in the future where Doctor Leo comes along and we go and find some hammerheads. This sounds like a plan, mate. I'm in. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Um, yeah, I'll tell you after the show. A hundred percent. I've got the I've got the location. Done deal. Oh, that'd be that'd be amazing. <laughs> um, just just out of curiosity, um, I'm, I'm assuming you you might have informed a few scientists of it. Um, I've spoken to a few people very quietly. Okay. I'm very, I'm very careful. I don't, I don't want to yeah, no, no, kind no, of no, give it no, away, no, you know. Yeah. No, fair, uh, fair, fair. Yeah. My, my lips are sealed. Pardon me. My lips are sealed. Yeah. Now the latest I heard was a, a, a few years ago. Now when I was looking at it in, in a bit more depth, and I think it was it would have been seven. So it, from now it would have been nine years ago when one was seen up on the northern coast of Australia. That's the only. <sighs> That's the only thing I've found yeah. of, of anywhere in the world. Jeez, that'd be an absolute trip seeing one of those. Mm-hmm. It'd be like seeing a ghost. It is. Like, I've got video footage. <sighs> I'll send it to you. Oh, please do. <laughs> please do. It's, it's only about uh, maybe 10 seconds or so. but um, 10 seconds is a long time when you think about it. Oh, yeah. Especially when you're, when you're only in the water and uh, your arse <laughs> is twitching. <laughs> <laughs> Happy days. Leo, um, I'm going to have to sign off and leg it to the dentist, get this sorted out so I can go on my holly bobs. So thank no you so much for coming no, on the show. Thank you. Thank you, mate. I had a ball. And, um, yeah, happy to come on another time. We've got to catch up for a beer, have a chat. And, mate, you're going to have to try and sh- get me to shut up because yeah, if, you start talking <laughs> about, if you start talking about sharks with me, mate, it's just not going to stop. That's all right. It makes Making, making episodes of podcasts are very easy when people just want to talk. It's fantastic. <laughs> and you talk with passion, so it makes it even better. Uh, so, lovely. Thank you. Too. 
Thanks again, mate. And um, just stay online. We'll have a little chat, chitter chatter afterwards. Thank you very much for joining the show and I uh, hope you enjoyed. Uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Bye for now. Thanks, everyone. Happy diving. This is Scuba Goat Under the Sea, the podcast for the inquisitive diver.